as you can see on the screen, our emphasis, at least for the beginning of the year, is the word God, I felt, gave me on this, that is, that is Ignite. And when I looked up the word Ignite, here's what we get. Defining. So you get a word from God, you want to you pull on that, because there's a lot there. And the word ignite means to set a fire, kindle, to cause to burn, to heat up, excite, to set in motion, spark, to catch the fire, begin to glow, inflame, light, torch. And that's what you get from the word ignite. Now, I can find a person in the Bible and go to that John chapter 5, verse 35, that shows us what that means. Here's a man who was ignited. If you remember, when Mary had just got the news of the, her, of the um, virgin birth, Mary, the virgin birth, she takes off to her cousin Elizabeth, or her sister, what, is, what was Elizabeth to Mary? My mind just went blank. Cousin. cousin? Yeah. And she was already, Elizabeth was already pregnant with John the Baptist six months. So she's six months pregnant. When she walks in, and in her greeting, Mary gets, or Elizabeth gets filled with the Spirit. John does as well. In the womb, he leaps. And he is ignited at that point by the word of the Lord, speaking through Mary, and just in greeting. There's a lot you can do with that, probably more than I can see right now. But what we know is John the Baptist comes on the scene in John chapter 5, verse 35. He's a burning and a shining light, or a bright and shining, burning light. And we see that is his description. Right in that verse right there. He was a burning and a bright, shining light. Now in Isaiah 60 it says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And so we see that that is God's intent for us is all of us follow the pattern of John the Baptist as bright, burning, shining lamps. Does that make sense? So we want to be a flame in 2022. After all the, the everything we've been through the last couple of years especially, um, that's in our past, but we want to, this is what God is pulling us into the future, and this is what we are to become, and there's a whole lot to that. I mean, to be a bright and shining, burning lamp you're going to be doing the works, greater works than these shall you do, right? All right, so last week we looked at the, you can, you can put a fire out in many different ways. Well, we looked last week at the wells of Abraham. Abraham was a tent dweller, and everywhere he went he dug wells because water is essential to life as the spirit is essential to life. The letter kills, but the spirit what? Gives life. And Jesus is a life-giving spirit. So we know that water is essential and physical, but it's also out of your belly shall flow life, rivers of living water. So we know that, that water in the Old Testament is essential physically, and it speaks to us spiritually. So when Abraham is digging these wells, he's getting water. Well, Isaac has to go back because he can't find a place to dwell. The king just kicked him out. And you find this in Genesis 26, I believe. We're not going to go there, but Genesis 26. And you can go back to the, to the Ignite screen because that's all the scripture I'm going to use today. We're not going to be long. So Abraham goes, or Isaac goes back. He's got nowhere to go. Water is essential. He's been kicked out of the land that he was in because he got too big for the king and for the people. And so they asked him to leave. And he's back to being a wanderer, a nomad, if you will, in the desert. And he's thinking, I'm going to go back to the wells that my father Abraham dug. And when he gets to those wells, the Philistines, which is a type of the enemy, has filled those wells up with all kinds of garbage. So he can't get to the water. So if we can't get to the water, which is Christ, is the living water, Christ, then we're going to not, we're not, we're going to be need, we're going to need ignited. And the way that he got to the wells was he had to get down in there 
and pull all that crap out that was in there to get to the water. And there's a lot of things in our lives that's keeping us from tapping into what's in us. Now, Paul says we have this treasure where? In earthen vessels. In earthen vessels. So that's how John the Baptist becomes a bright, burning lamp because he's drawing from the spirit that he's been filled with. We're drawing from the life of Christ that we have been won to. O-N-E-D, if that's a word. I'm making it up if it ain't. I'm, I'm one. It is now. I'm one with, in union to the Lord. I'm drawing from the... And that's how come rivers of John 7. Do I have that one? I think that way we do have that one from last week. John chapter 7. In that... He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So I'm, I'm partaking of the divine nature that's in me, that I'm one with, and that's what's making me a bright and shining lamp. Now we're going to develop that as we go, because there's, a, there's many different facets, and many ways we, we can take off from that. What I want to do this morning, and draw your attention to, and I'm not the originator of this diagram, although just like I wasn't the originator of the flathead that we do periodically. So um, we don't have an outline today because the board's going to be the outline. So if you want to write this down or copy this down on a piece of paper, you might want to do that. Here's a triangle. This is going to help you understand where I want to go. Um, we have past. We have present. That's where we are now. This is where we've been. This is where we are now. And we have future. Now there is a dynamic happening every single day, every second, every hour of the day that you're not, you're, you're kind of aware of. I'm going to bring your attention to it. I want to talk about these three aspects of life. This is time. This is our time, right? This is God creating time. And we also have eternity. Don't ever see eternity and time as two different things. Because then you're in separation. You want to see eternity as part of time. You miss that. There, I can't help you. You got to know that, well, prove that. On earth, what? As it is in heaven. In time, as it is in eternity. So you've got to keep that in mind. That's bedrock. All right, so we've got the past. Now I'm going to talk about the weight of the past or the drag. The drag of the past and the pull of the future while you and I are in the present. Okay, you follow me? The drag of the past the pull of the future as we live in the present. Because every single person, whether he's saved, I don't care whether he's unsaved, unsaved, saved or what, this happens to everybody. Now, what about this past? Let's talk about this past first. What does this past represent? Everything you've done prior to conversion. That's when you've been awakened to the gospel. And in this past are nothing but, but veils, right? Veils that create darkness, wrong ideas, wrong ideologies, everything as a man thinks so he is. So all this you, you've been taught. Remember if we go back to the flathead and all those voices that create, give you all those ideas, they create your identity. Remember the flathead, right? All right, so that's all, that's, that's your past. And that's not only the veils, things you've been taught that's wrong that creates the darkness that you're walking in, which is a skewed ID, you don't know your identity. But here's another, all the horrible things, death that's happened, divorce, bankruptcy, every bad thing that traumatized you as a, as a, as a baby, as an adolescent, as an adult, that's all in your past. Some of it you dealt with, probably most of you haven't, to be honest. You're, you know, we had an uncle that came over every now and then that was drunk. You ever have a, a drunk uncle that comes over to your house and you're a kid and you're like, 
you know, you don't know really what drunk is. He's just not acting normal. And mom and dad won't sit you down and explain that to you. They act like it didn't happen. And anything, this, is, this was my family. I can talk, my dad's not here. I'm free to talk about my past. Is we put everything under the rug. No one ever sat you down and explained, well, this is why that happened. We just ignored it, put it under the rug, and nobody talked about it. So how do I deal with darkness in my past when no one wants to talk about it? Because when you don't talk about it, you don't bring healing to it, you don't bring illumination to it, and so it's there, and guess what? As a child, what did I do? What did Paul say? As a child, I fought like a child. So I had to figure it out. If an adult is not going to speak truth to me, then a little five-year-old has to figure it out, and he can't. So whatever the hell he comes up with is what he's going to believe. So don't, don't talk to your kids. Illuminate them. Now, I'm gonna, now, what happens is this past now is creating who I am. Now, however many years we're into this thing, let's talk about the present. I am dealing with the present by my flawed understanding of the past. I can't, many people can't move on to the future, the pull of the future, because of the drag of the, of the past. Some people can never have relationships. That's why they're in divorce all the time. They can never have relationships because, and it's not their fault, they, they haven't dealt with the past. Maybe they don't have the ability to deal with the past. Or maybe there's principalities and powers and strongholds that keep them from experiencing what God wants to do in their life. Now, that just put me in a, what does God want to do in their life? I want to put in the middle here, eternal, um, the eternal plan of God. This is what we're dealing with. This is, this is the pool of the future, is God's eternal plan. You find this in Ephesians 3.11, and you find it in Ephesians 1.11. We know God has an eternal purpose. I can put purpose there. Let's put that there. Plan, purpose. God's eternal purpose is what's drawing you into the future, but you've got the drag of the, of the past that won't let you go into what he's eternally called you to until these things in the past get dealt with. Does that make sense? Because everything he's drawing you to is out of resurrection. But I can't be drawn into resurrection until there's what? Come on. Death. Can't be raised until you die. So the cross is essential for this to be worked out. Because you died in the past through death and you're raised to his eternal purpose through resurrection. <coughs> Make sense? Huh? Yeah. All right, so right now where you sit, I don't care, every one of us, right now there is a drag pulling on you called past. All of us. In our present, we're being drugged back to keep being the person we've always been or what we're accustomed to, or you could call this, this is what's familiar and I always return to it. God wants to bring me into the unknown, but I keep wanting to go back to the familiar. We can do a million, do you understand by that? We can do a million things with this triangle and go many different directions. Huh? But what I want you to see is that this is a dynamic being played out right now. Now, what happens when there is no fire inside of us where we are a bright and shining lamp burning? What's that ignite that which ignites us is the water, and that dynamic has to be going on in us, which is the pull of the future. So God's not going to ask you to get somewhere without not sourcing you with something to get you there. For instance, if you put a rocket, I mean you've seen people go to the moon, people go into orbit, you know. We just had one recently. Um, but they have a rocket. That rocket is sitting there, and, and you've got the pull of, of where, what, what they want to do with it. That's the plan of um, man to 
put that thing up there. But they need some source to get it up there. You know, all those G's force in, the, in that rocket that they're going to what? Ignite. Ignite. There has to be something to ignite all that G-force to get that thing to go up there. And the Holy Spirit, that's why the power of the Spirit poured out on the day of Pentecost, on us, in us, around us, is that source called dynamite in the Greek, where something explodes in us called born again, like Christ in us, that propels us into the future called His eternal purpose. If that doesn't happen, you are stuck over here. And you are only reliving what you already know. And that's your future. Right here is your future. Hmm? That's why alcoholics stay alcoholics. That's why you keep making the same mistakes you keep making, the same patterns. Your, your, your future is based on your past. But he breaks that called death, gives us the power of the Holy Spirit called life, and resurrects us with a G-force, if you will, which is the Holy Spirit, propelling us, pulling us the future. God's eternal purpose is pulling us into the future through resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit. And death is what breaks this from dragging us back. Hmm? That make sense? All right, in John chapter 21, well, let's do this. We're going to look at Peter real quick. Because Peter is a perfect chart. After the death of Jesus, you've got three days he's in the heart of the earth. All right, so he's told them that he's going to be raised from the dead. I showed you that they don't believe he's going to be raised from the dead. And even when they're looking at an empty tomb, they're still not believing it, the disciples, right? All right, so in that three-day period, we're going to look at the life of Peter. And in that three-day period, you find in John, I think it's John chapter 21. In the first verses, it says, Peter goes back to fishing. Well, is that what you do in that three-day period? Jesus is dead. I guess it's over. I'm going to go back to fishing. So I want you to see something. What's Peter's, Peter is about, Peter was, the, as far as I understand from history, Peter's the oldest disciple, around 30 years old. Just so you know, John is the youngest disciple, who was about 19 years old. Mary was probably 15 years old, maybe a little, I'm going to go more, be more conservative, probably 15 years old when she got pregnant. But, um, so you got Peter, and in his past, and I'm going to say, what? This, the culture then is different. I'm going to tell you right now, more than likely, he probably started fishing right before he became a teenager. So I'm going to say he's probably been a good conservative estimate is 15 years fishing. That's all he knows. And that's what he's, that's his present, he's, he's being traumatized right now in his present because of the cross of Jesus, the death of Christ. He doesn't know what to do so he goes back to his past, all that he knows to do, familiarity, 15 years. Now that's just fishing. What do we do when we come? I'm going to tell you what right now. And the reason why I'm doing this is because many people got hit in 2020 and 2021 in a way we've never as a culture or society <coughs> or a country has ever been hit. This, is, this was huge. It crippled what that virus did crippled many people financially, spiritually, emotionally. They shut down churches. They shut down businesses. They told you you couldn't go to families. And that traumatizes people in many different ways. I'm trying. I can't ignite you to 2022 until we make sure we didn't get screwed up in the last two years. Or not only that, 10 years ago. I don't know what happened. To you. I just know that in, my, in this church, over the last 20, we've been here since 98, how many years is that? 24 years? That I have seen people come and go, and they always go based on something presently happening in their life called crisis. They get sick, and then they never come back. 
They have a death, they never come back. They have a divorce, they never come back. I had a guy at one time, I can say this because this is years ago, I had a guy wanted to talk sex with another girl, so he sat over there, she sat over there, and he's calling her up for sex. Remember that? And wants to talk sex on the phone. Well, you know, he didn't even give me a chance to correct him, but as soon as she turned him down, he left. So I got with him, and I said, look, I'm, I'm not going to, you're not going to tell me about it, that's fine, but I, you don't need to leave the church, and there's really no reason we, we can work anything out. But again, he let that be the thing that got him out. So my point is, I've seen them come, I've seen them go. And the reason is something back here snags them. The drag of the flesh, the drag of the, flesh, the past, got them in the present where a crisis they went through, and they never dealt with something, and it triggered something here, and they're gone. You're, 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 you're capable of being triggered. Something in your past might come up, something you never dealt with, hits you in the present, and you can't eat, you can't get your future, you can't get pulled to the future because you let the past. Let me tell you, God has forgiven you of the past. He dealt a death blow. That past has no power over you. That's what we have been doing called spiritual formation. Get you to understand all that garbage from Stockholm Syndrome, phantom pain, all those analogies are no longer true about you. So if we can get, if we can deal with this, then we can have, then we can have the pull. This is grace. This pull, this pull of future is the grace of God. You can't, you can't get there unless He pulls you. Ezekiel says, "I will put my spirit in them." Prophesy the new covenant. I'll put my spirit in them and cause them to walk after me. This is causation happening here. You can't produce this G-force. You try called willpower. You use steps, secrets, and keys to get there. You ain't getting there. Hmm? You get there because I put my spirit in you. I do it. So I don't need religion. I don't need steps, secrets, and keys. I need that power of the spirit, the light of God, the water. That's, I've got this treasure in earthen vessels. If I can tap into it and not be lied and deceived out of it by the drag of the past, and the darkness and the veils. So Peter goes back fishing. He goes back fishing. Now, what I want you to see is he has a crisis. It's the cross. Jesus prophesied his resurrection, but he doesn't believe it because something in his past, for whatever reason, veils, keeps him from believing the truth that Mary didn't Mary didn't go back to it. Mary was hanging out. She, she was there. And when she saw that the tomb was empty, she went and told them, hey, the tomb was empty. But you never see this, this guy went back fishing. Two disciples go on the road to Damascus. We're, uh, uh, Emmaus, we're getting out of here. So a, a bomb was literally dropped in their hand, in their, in Thomas. He's not going to believe unless he sees. No, no. They go back fishing. And even I think John and James, they go back and they say, we're going with you. So they're out there on the, they're out there on the sea fishing. And so if you read John chapter 21, what happens is that they are now back in their past. They're reliving their past. Yes, it was fishing, but you can take this. They're going back to the old husband. They're going back to the old job. Things maybe God delivered them from but they're going back to what they're comfortable with and what they know. That never happens. God never takes you back to Egypt. God will never take you back to the wilderness. He's leading you into the land of Canaan for all that Canaan has, and, he, and, you, and the will of God is never to go back to the wilderness or Egypt. You don't ever go back to what you're dead to. But we do. And we engage death in our life, and we keep repeating the same stuff over and over, and we realize why is this happening to me? We don't have a, but we, you know, but we're all we're looking for. We're always looking to blame somebody for this. No, you're the repeat offender, because you never got over the past that keeps dragging you this way out of your, so you can repeat the past 
in the present and never be drawn to the eternal purpose of God called the future. You can just sit there, and I'm going to tell you, I can stop right now if nobody was in here, and I could just sit there and look at that, and I know the Spirit would speak a million things to me, and I'd have to be writing them down. I know that, because I'm going to do that. I've been doing that. This, this is as much for me as it is for you. I'm not going to go around the mountain of 2020 again. I don't care what they do out there. I ain't doing that. Or 2021. Lord, what are you doing? That's what I'm doing. And which, well, let me just say this as a sidebar. Eugene Peterson. Um, I can't remember the book. Uh, he's the one who has the message Bible. And by the way, I am so tired of people criticizing the Passion Translation and the Message Translation. Because they're not literal. And, they, and the guys who wrote those know they're not literal. Let me ask you a question. Are you against commentaries? No. Because what you've got is a theologian who's going to expound the scriptures. He's going to go to that verse. He's going to give you the Greek. He's going to give you the Hebrew. He's going to give you his take on it. That's called commentary. And I've never heard anybody criticize commentaries. Swagger loves um, Matthew Henry's commentary. He says he's read it through a million times. I use Swagger because he's very, he's very critical of the Message Bible. Do you know what the Message Translation is? Commentary. A freaking commentary. He's looked at the Hebrew, it's the Old Testament, he's looked at the Greek, and he's given you some commentary on it and put it in a Bible context. I think Jimmy Swigert did <coughs> that. His commentary is in the red of the, old, of, of the scriptures. He's doing the same thing. No, none of those guys, Passion Translation or The Message, is telling you this is a literal translation. If they are, then we can debate them and say, nah, I don't think so. Or The Living Translation. They pound that one to death. But I'm telling you, if you take on that mentality, you are missing rich context that will help you understand the scripture. They're not going the opposite of the Greek or Hebrew. So they're not in error. I don't, I don't, I don't understand this mentality today. I just don't. But to go back to Eugene P Peterson, I'll just give you that because I'm referencing you. Who's he? He wrote the message Bible. Translated it. He says, and I've lost my train of thought, so let me get a drink here. Look at that. Cup holder. Put a cup holder there for me. What was I talking about? Thank you, Eugene. I was trying to give you a little bit of a... What was I talking about? See, you got lost with me in that bunny trail as well. As well. That gone, I hate when that happens. I probably will never get it back. So what's the last thing you remember me saying? Eugene Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, there you go. So Eugene Peterson in his book, and I lost it again. This is this is comical. I, my last thing I have is don't go back to what you're dead to. I don't know if that helps you, but unbelievable. No. Okay. I can't believe that. This is why you just need to just stick with your notes and don't go down those sides. Hey, next time I say, hey, I'm going to give you a sidebar. Say, no, no, don't do the sidebar. What was that book? I just read, was reading that book the other day. <laughs> well, let me move on to my next, <laughs> next thing. <laughs> so they went back fishing, and you got three disciples with them. They're going back to what they know. These guys are going back. Let me ask you a question. Where are they going to go to? For all they know, let me do this. All they know was the three and a half years versus 15 years of fishing, three and a half years of spending time with Jesus. He's gone. Is, is that three and a half years been a waste? So they go back to the pool of the, the drag of the past. And they go back to fishing. That's all they know. There is no future for them. What are they going to move on to? So their present becomes their past. That's all we know to do. But God will never let you go back to Egypt. God will never let you go back to the wilderness. 
He's always bringing you into new. I even had this title, um, Ignite. New you, new year, and I thought, new you, new year. How many people are doing that? And I thought, well, maybe it's an old you, new year. It's both. It's both. God's trying to bring you into the new by taking you out of the old. So let's, let's do this now. Let's put new here. New and old. So there's, you're, you're both. You're Jekyll and Hyde going into 2022. God's trying to take you out of the old and into the new. But he will never, ever return you to the old. Now, when I say out with the old, in with the older, that's not what I'm talking about. Because you know what's happening in the church today, all this new stuff. And they're leaving theology. They're leaving history. They're leaving things our forefathers, our early church fathers, the patristics would roll in their grave if they seen the stuff we do, or the things we believe today yeah, as a church. So don't get that mixed up. I'm talking about your past that's darkened by veils and lies and deceptions of the enemy. God will never bring you back to a lie. He'll never take you back to Egypt, and he'll never let you go back to the wilderness. He's always going to move you into the future. And he does that by putting his spirit in you, Ezekiel, and causing you that G-force called grace, the spirit, power of the spirit, propel you to the pool of the future. He's the one pulling from the future. That's good. That's really good. The future is crying out to you, pulling you. And that future is called eternal purpose. That's what you focus on, is the eternal purpose of God. So they're stuck fishing. How do they get out of that cycle of all they know is the past, so they return to it? And if Jesus doesn't show up, they're going to be fishermen the rest of their life. Not for men, but for fish. They're stuck. They're stuck in their past, stuck in what lies that they they're just stuck here. They can't get up here, so their present is going to be repeated by the past. They're going to go, they're going, they're going back to fishing. So what does God do? You know the story? What does God do? Jesus shows up on the beach and draws them back to him. <clears throat> so what would you call that? Dinner. <laughs> Good. Encounter. Oh. If Jesus does not encounter these guys on the sea, they're not returning. They're not going to go to their eternal future, their eternal purpose of God. Since they went back here. Listen, ain't that a beautiful thing? That God doesn't get rid of Peter because he denies the Lord, but lets him preach the message, what, 15 days later? Mm -hmm. Shoot, I used to have to sit down for three years before I can come back if I sin. Oh, you sin, sit down there for a year. Sit down there for, depending upon the severity of the sin, the longer the sit. They call that church discipline. Where's his discipline? He cussed, he cursed, he denied, and he gets to be the one. Fifteen days later, I mean, he even returns to fishing. He told, forget you, I'm going back to what I know. <laughs> That's good. God will never, you can return here. No guilt, no condemnation, but just know who's returning with you. There you go. The Spirit. And He's going to bring you back to the present and keep drawing you to the future. In the present. He's not going to let you stay in the past and the present, but He's going to draw you, pull you to the future called grace, mercy, compassion. That's what Christ in you does. He doesn't, He's not going to pound you for going back. He doesn't, he doesn't criticize these guys for going fishing, does He? No. He doesn't say, what's wrong with you? I can't believe you're doing this. I told you to be fishers of men, and you're going back fishing. What's wrong with you? That's what the church does now. I was raised in what's wrong with you. Was you? Yeah. He cooks them dinner. He doesn't want to discipline them. Give them what for. He cooks them dinner. What is that dinner? Revelation. He stands where? At the door. And what's he doing? Knocking. Knocking. That's what he's doing. He comes back 
knocking on their doors while they're fishing. They encounter him. And what's the purpose of knocking? That I can come in and what? Sup with you, sup with me. Dinner. Partaking is what dinner signifies. Partaking and receiving of the Lord. And that's what that's the encounter. Every encounter of God that you have will be of receiving and partaking. Him. Not doing. Here's things to do. No. Partaking of Him is the encounter. And that is what ignites you. You want to ignite him? Encounter him. But don't encounter him by doing. Encounter him by sitting with him and letting him pour into you. He's the one pulling. He, he's, the future is pulling. He's the one doing the pulling called grace. Out so that your present will always be going into the future, not returning back to the past. You can 2022 can be a return of the past. Or 2022 can be the pull of the future. That's going to be it. Based on not what you do or don't do, but who you encounter this yeah. year. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. All right, so let me close with this. I told you it wasn't going to be long. This is an old myth. I, I, I remember reading this out in the 80s. I was just a young, young punk, 20-some years old, early 20s. And I remember reading this. And what it was is, the myth was, here's all these angels in heaven, and here's Jesus being rose from the dead, and in his ascension, he enters at the right hand of the Father. Now, this didn't happen. This is a myth, but it speaks. And they're all, you go to Revelation, they're all holy, holy, holy. They're all glorifying Jesus. Yeah. And all that praise is going on. And then one man comes up and says, Sir, I have a question. Lord, I have a question. Yeah, what if this, you, you, you pulled it off. This is the greatest story ever told. This is the greatest event that's ever happened. This, is, this will be the, the, the center of history, past, present, future, the whole, this cross, you pulled it off. But, I have a question. What if Peter, this is what he asked, what if Peter would have went back to fishing? Well, he kind of did. Yeah, he did. But what if he would have went back to fishing, and the others... James and John, they had a business with their father Zebedee. What if they go back to their father's business? And what if Matthew returns to collecting taxes? And what if Mary returns to prostitution? What? Because that could have happened, Jesus. That could have happened. What if they would have went back to fishing? You know what Jesus' response was? I had no other plan. Think about that. He didn't have a plan B. This thing he pulled off now depends upon us, but not solely upon us because he enters into us and empowers us at, with that G-force and ignites us to be bright and shining, burning lamps for him, doing the greater works. He's doing that through us. That's not... That that bright and shining lamp of John is not of John's own making. By praying more, fasting more, reading more, he did the 12 steps, four secrets, and two keys, and now he's dead. No. That's a result of Christ in him, the hope of glory. That's the result of him being filled with the Holy Spirit and nothing else. Nothing else. He encountered God. And God encountered him. Does that make sense? So let me close with this. Do a Google search if you don't believe me. Do a Google, Google search on imitating Christ. I'm only drinking this to use my cup holder. I like that cup holder. <laughs> Do a Google search on imitating Christ. It'll sit, well, it may not, but it's sickened me. I could not find any article. And I went, I, went, I went deep into the rabbit hole, and I couldn't find anything but you doing what he does. That puts it all on you. I can't imitate him. He didn't call me to imitate him. The Ten Commandments show me I can't imitate him. So I'm thinking about that. 
And I'm like, and I heard, and I, I think I heard this. I won't tell you who I heard it from in case I didn't hear it right because I couldn't remember where to go find it because I, I watched so much stuff. But I heard this guy say, we're not imitating God. God is imitating us. And I'm like, what? That doesn't sound right. So let me sit there and meditate on this. So I do the Google search. Is anybody saying that God imitates us? He ain't going to find that anymore. I'm not find that anywhere. So what's he talking about? Did I misunderstand him? I know I heard him say, we don't imitate God. We can't. But I'm almost 199.999. He did say we imitate God. And then I'm like, okay, I can go with that because of what we've taught about in the past. We haven't used that term. So let me walk that out with you in closing. My second closing, by the way is that how does God imitate us? Because that also almost sounds blasphemous. Who am I to be imitated? I'm the one I'm the one needed to die. You can't imitate me. I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. How you how you want to imitate me? He imitated us by becoming us. Think about the conversations God had with Jesus in the Trinity before the foundation of the world. You're going to have to become man. You're going to imitate man by becoming human. I, he could not imitate me staying in heaven being spirit. The only way he could imitate man is to become man. And in that respect, he did imitate us by becoming human. But he didn't imitate the fall of Adam. What he did was he imitated us as human to show us how to become human. And that's what we see in the incarnation. God became human and lived humanity in a way that no one else could, not even Adam. Right. Then, as incarnation, and then he incarnates himself again in us through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Does that make sense? And now we imitate God because he's imitating us. The only way I can imitate God is to live the life of God in me who became human. I'm imitating him out of oneness, out of partaking. Not as my own source called willpower, secrets and keys and steps, but out of the G-force called grace, the life of Christ in me. I am imitating God. It's easy to imitate George, Michael Jordan if he's playing basketball in you and through you. I'll be Michael Jordan. I would love to imitate him huh? on, the, on, the, on the basketball court. But I can't imitate him, can I? <clears throat> unless his life is in me, doing it. Hmm? What's, what's imitation? Imitation crab meat. What does that mean? Huh? Fake. Yeah. Like you imitating God is pure fake. Unless you're truly born again, and you're one with him, and you know it, and you're living from that source then it's a real imitation. But it's really the real thing. Because you're right. <clears throat> Ponder that. Think on that. Because I think what God's leading us into is new. How's he not? I, I don't want to say new you for a new year. You, because we're always being nude and renewed. Right. right. I'm just using it because this is the new year. Mm -hmm. And we do that. Okay. We play that in our minds called time. We do that. And... and Sometimes God wants to emphasize and compartmentalize our time. And um, sometimes I may not have anything. We should go right into the new year. With what, but, I, 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 but I really felt many of us have been crippled. And we're trying to make sense out of life now. You're not going to. Just try to I'm just trying to figure life out good. That's trying to find, that's, try, that's trying to figure out what's in the darkness without light. Good luck with looking for stuff in the dark. You're groping. You're never going to figure it out. But light, this is what encounter is. Encounter is you turning to the light and the light shining on you and the glory being revealed in you. That's good. That should be, that's encounter. Yeah. I'm not giving you anything. Oh, you start this for the new year. Start that for the new year. I'm getting you, people fasted for the new year. 
That's great if your focus was to encounter. Then, then awesome. But I didn't fast, and that's okay. Did anybody fast? I know, you're not supposed to let anybody know whether you did or not. But that's okay, because it's not about fasting. It's not, those things help us, but if God's not in them, it's a religious work. But if God's like, look, I, I, I've, I've got a, a, a time for me and you, I want to I I unveil something to you, and I need your 100% focus. That's called fast. I need you to set aside some time. That's called prayer. <coughs> or, if you're like me, I ain't praying, I ain't fasting, I'm driving in my car, and he's unveiling stuff. <coughs> I'm sitting on the toilet, and he's unveiling stuff. <laughs> okay? Right? Taking a shower. And he's unveiling stuff. How can he not? If he's in you, He's doing, I'll tell you what, he'll unveil something to you right after you sin. Not write you off, but unveil something to you. And you're like, oh, yes. I get so much unveiled to me after my sin, it makes me want to sin more so I can get more unveiling. I'm not lying, doesn't, I'm not saying I'm going to sin more. But it's just so awesome and beautiful that God is not going to write me off when I sin, but unveil himself right after the sin. That's crazy. I've heard people in the in in their sin, God breaking through and speaking to them while they're sinning and having an encounter. It's all about encounter. If you keep encountering God, He'll keep delivering you from the past, propelling you into the future. But the encounter is the present. So let's put that there and then I'm done. So you know what the present is supposed to look like. Don't go back to the past, and I can't get up there unless I unless something happens here called encounter. That's it. That's it. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the grace and the mercy of God. That you entered into our darkness. You entered into our humanity, and you're working light and glory called good. And the grace, which is the pull of the future, bringing us into the eternal purpose that you have for all of us. And that's God unveiling primarily himself to you, conforming you into his image, and preparing you for what he's raised you for, called destiny. We all have it. It's calling us. It's drawing us. And the Spirit is leading and guiding us into it. Lord, we ask for continual encounters through the scriptures, through our worship, through our liturgies, through all that we do. Keep unveiling yourself. And we'll keep encountering you. And that's the pull of the future.